invite everyone to talk at the dinner and everything, how they want to go. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Shafi. Um, I used to be a student in Sudan. Um, I graduated quite a while back, but um, some of you may see me uh, here for Juma. I do come for Juma here. Um, uh, so, um, before I start, I'd like to just clarify something. Um, the topic that was given to me is etiquette of the good Muslim. However, I'd like to just uh, mention that um, I won't be addressing the topic the way it is worded, you know, the, the way it is exactly worded. Um, I won't be uh, discussing exactly on, those, on, on that theme. The reason being, if you look at the leaflet, um, even flyer, which I assume you will, um, you know, the flyer mentions the hadith. The hadith about you know, the rights of one Muslim over another, the, the six rights that uh, a Muslim has over another Muslim. And then it makes a few other points, I think, in the flyer. It's basically talking about how you should treat your Muslim brother. You know, how to deal with your uh, brother in Islam. Uh, how you should treat him. So, I will be taking that angle, inshallah. You know, and of course, um, in a university setting like this, we have Muslims come from different parts of the world, we come together. It's important to understand you know, the, the rights that we have over one another and how we should uh, treat each other, deal with each other, inshallah. And again, you know, this topic, uh, probably what I'm going to say, you may have heard a lot before already, something really new, but it's a good reminder for everyone, including myself. Uh, and there's some you know, beautiful hadith of the Prophet said that it is uh, worth mentioning on this topic. So it's going to be a short reminder, inshallah. And um, I know you know, the Binyami is right there. Uh, uh, so if I go for too long, then probably you guys might just leave me alone and walk for the Binyami. So I'll keep it short, inshallah. Right? So, first thing, first thing to remember is our brothers in Islam, you know, the, the feeling that we have towards them is of love. So, we should love our brothers. But not just love, we should know the, the, the basis of this love. The basis of this love for our brothers in Islam is, you know, is uh, love, of, love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First, our, you know, the, our, the utmost love that we should have in our hearts is for Allah and His Messenger of Allah and Islam. And then all the other love should flow from there. And then we should learn to love and hate for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So just as we would love uh, you know, the actions of Islam um, has defined as good actions, uh, similarly we would have hatred for those actions that Islam has defined as bad actions, right? So I'm just giving you an example of how our love should be defined by um, our love for Allah and His messages of Allah. So likewise, uh, when it comes to loving your brothers, um, in Islam it should be for the sake of Allah. So we should love, we should love each other for the sake of Allah. The reason why I'm saying this, and I'm emphasizing this point of loving for the sake of Allah, because um, you know, many of us um, have grown up in societies where um, in our uh, our loyalties, our identities are defined by cultural or nationalistic, ethnic, uh, you know, a background or borders. Or political borders. You know, so uh, we might, you know, uh, we might be carrying on that baggage that we uh, have absorbed from society in terms of you know, that we, we look at things from a very nationalistic perspective or um, uh, or a, a very narrow um, uh, perspective where uh, uh, ethnicity or tribe or language or culture or um, nationality may uh, come to define our and our uh, loyalties are, um, you know, um, um, you know how we identify ourselves, and uh, you know, it may also happen that you know that uh, if it becomes a nationalistic, we love or we prefer a brother for his uh, for his nationalistic background and not for his Islam, and that is problematic, right? So I come from, for example, I come from Bangladesh, nice. I prefer a Bengali brother just because he is from Bangladesh over another Muslim brother who may be from Indonesia or somewhere else. Um, and then, then, then my love really is not 
purely defined by Islam. It's, you know, it's other things that are corrupting my love. So my love for the Muslims should be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So regardless of whether you are from the same country as me, or whether you were born somewhere else, whether you have the same skin color or, uh, as me, whether you speak the same language uh, as me or not, just by the mere fact that you have submitted yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you become my brother in Islam. Right? So my love for you should be on that basis, that you are my brother in Islam, regardless of whichever country or whatever, uh, or very well else you may be from. So that's the first thing that we should remember. Um, it's worth mentioning some hadith, um, to this effect, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, more or less the nearest meaning, whoever loved a man for the sake of Allah and said, I love you for the sake of Allah, and they were uh, and then they were admitted to the Jannah, and the one who loved was of higher rank from the other, he would be joined with the one um, uh, with the one uh, who loved. So here Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying that you know, if you love a man for the sake of Allah. First criteria is loving for the sake of Allah, right? Not for um, any other criteria in nationality or whatever else. If you love a man for the sake of Allah, and you say to him, I love you for the sake of Allah. Now it may sometimes you may be a little bit embarrassed, but there's nothing embarrassing about telling your brother that you love him for the sake of Allah. Yeah? So let me tell you this, I love you for the sake of Allah. Uh, so, you know, it's good to let your brother know that you love him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you love a man for Allah's sake, you tell him that you love him for Allah's sake and then you know uh, if they were if both these people were admitted to Jannah then you know if one of them was in a higher level in Jannah then the one at the lower level will be brought up to the higher level because he loved that person for the sake of Allah. So imagine this if you love Muslim brother and he's say more pious than you, you know, let's say he's more knowledgeable than you and he does a lot of ibadah more than you, but if you love him for the sake of Allah and he is in a higher rank in Jannah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate you to his level because you love him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not just a, a trivial thing, right? So it's love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that we, we should inculcate in our hearts. And then with that love comes responsibilities. Yeah, love is not just mere words. And that it, it's telling Allah oh, love for the sake of Allah and then it does not reflect your actions. So with that love comes uh, rights and responsibilities towards um, your brothers. Right? Uh, so I'll just mention a few, there are many, but uh, um, I said I, I, I want to keep it brief. So um, I'll just mention a few um, points here. Defending your brother in Islam. In a hadith, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, what does it mean? A believer is the mirror of his brother, and the believer is the brother of another believer. When they met, he holds back from him his loss and defends him in his absence. So we should try and defend our brothers, hold back any loss, any harm that may be coming his way. So we won't try and you know, uh, try and uh, you know, abstain from doing justice to our brothers. But the other thing to remember is neither do we abandon him. That is, you don't commit injustice yourself, but if someone is committing injustice to him, you don't just let him suffer. Rather, you go to his aid and you try and help him out. So, you know, the brother needs some help. Um, I don't know, let's say, uh, in class, they got his brother was stuck with some assignment. I'm not saying you should do his assignment, but then help him out. You know, if you need some help, you know, be generous, kind of. Help him out, but it, you know, that's just at, a, at an individual level. If your brothers can actually, um, um, uh, you know, his, uh, his national hardship, if you can't help him out, um, and uh, you know, this, this is an in individual, individualistic context. But then we should look at this is not a brotherhood at a broader level. It's not just the brothers whom you meet who are your brothers in Islam, but also the, the rest of the Ummah you know, globally. They are also your brothers and sisters, and we should also have this care for them. You know, the, the, the love for the sake of Allah should also extend towards the brothers who are not in our immediate vicinity. Right? Um, so we must be concerned about the affairs of the Ummah, and uh, uh, we should try and help them out to whatever way we can. Recently we saw what happened, for example, in the, the Central African Republic. Um, you know, 
there are very few um, reports of how Muslims were massacred, killed. Even you know, there are even reports of kangaroos. Uh, a Muslim was burnt and his flesh was eaten. That that was the extent to which the our brothers and sisters in Central African Republic were made to suffer. And that's not just one incident. Right? There are I mean, millions of Muslims around the world suffering from many different problems, be it poverty or military occupation or you know, oppression under uh, tyrannical rulers. So we need to be concerned. We need to be concerned. And as the Hadith says, he neither, as a Muslim does not oppress a Muslim, neither does he abandon him. Now, we are here, alhamdulillah, Allah SWT has granted us security and safety. You know, it is a test for us as well. You know, we should think about what can we do for our brothers and sisters globally who are, you know, who are suffering. That care and concern should be there. And also we should make an effort, whatever means we can, um, to try and help our brothers and sisters who are um, in need and who are oppressed. And the same hadith says that uh, whoever helps to remove the hardship of his brother will have his difficulties removed by Allah in this world and in the hereafter. So don't think that, oh, okay, look, there's too much headache, there's so much problems on the home, I can't think about it, too much headache. No, so I'll just let, let them be. Uh, I'll just carry on with my own life. Don't think about that. Because, you know, also I'm saying that if you really try to remove the hardship of your brothers and sisters, Allah will remove your hardship in this life and the hereafter. So don't think that you close your eyes, don't watch the news anymore, you don't want to hear about how Muslims are suffering. Don't think that you know, things will be easy for you. Right? So um, you know, it is only Allah SWT who can solve the problems that we face in our life. Right? And everyone has offered such problems. If we expect the help of Allah SWT, we should try and help our brothers and sisters. Of course, uh, locally, you know, the brothers that we meet at uni, or in the local community, if they are in need, we should help them. Also globally, the brothers and sisters who are suffering, we should try and help them out. And we should have their concern in our, uh, in our hearts. In another hadith of Sallallahu Alaihi says, Allah continues to help a servant so long as he goes on helping his brother. So, if you continue helping your brother, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Then, um, you should also continue making dua for your brother. You know, making dua for your brothers uh, and sisters in Islam is good for you. It, it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's something for which even you are rewarded. You are the one making dua, you're asking for something good for your brother or sister in Islam. Then Allah SWT not only accepts your dua for your brother and sister, but He also um, you know, gives you a uh, reward for it. And again, in a, in a hadith of Rasulullah SAW, it says, the supplication of a Muslim for his brother in his absence is accepted. And the commissioned angel says, Amin, and says, the same is for you too. So if you make dua for your brother and sister, then the angels say Amin to that, and the same for you too. Now, uh, last year I went to Hajj, Alhamdulillah, Allah SWT gave me the opportunity, the opportunity, the great opportunity to uh, uh, you know, to make Hajj, Alhamdulillah. Now, if any of you have been to Hajj, probably have had the same experience. People come and give you long lists of words. Literally, you know, people message me on Facebook, email me, some gave me a sheet, like handwritten words on a sheet. So I was carrying around all these words with me. So you know, that, like some brothers to ask for specific words. So I so you know, I have to make words in that in Hajj. Now, when you are in Arafah, like that is the time that you want to make your dua, you know, as much dua as you can. That's the time when dua is accepted. That's the that is the moment, right? If you have anything to ask for, that is the moment, the moment to ask for it. So give and you've got all these long lists of dua to make for all these other people as well. Um, but then you, know, you should not be thinking at all. Look, I want, I only want to make my own dua. I only want to ask for myself in this blessed time, which. I may not ever have it again in my life. Don't think that you know, if, you're, if you're making love for your brothers and sisters that you're wasting your time. Rather, you know, if you make love for your brothers and sisters, then the name will say Amin to that and they also invoke the same love on you. So why do you make love for them? The same will apply to you Sean. So make love for your brothers and sisters and make uh, a lot of them. And then, uh, 
greeting your brothers uh, and sisters with a smiling face. That's something I need to work on. Yeah? Uh, some of us have a real problem with smiling. So um, when you when you uh, meet your brother or sister, um, the salam that you should give, you should give it. Um, not just someone who has it. It's very difficult to say the salam. I mean, it's not really coming out of your mouth. So you say say it with uh, a lot of love. You know, so say it cordially and with a uh, warm smile, warm big smile on your face. Soon, smile face. So um, you know, um, say your salam. Uh, with a big smile. Something that all of us should uh, work on, especially myself. Uh, the thing related to it is do not belittle even, even the smallest act of kindness. Even if it were no more than meeting your brother with a smiling and cheerful face. So, the Lord has been telling us not to belittle any act of kindness. Even if it's just a smile towards your brother. Right? So, you, you, you meet your brothers all the time, something about the yeah. mm -hmm. Imagine, if you're smiling at your brother, you always are smiling. So, that's pretty good atmosphere. Uh, every act of kindness is charity. Every act of kindness is charity. Smiling in the face of your brother is charity. And pouring out from your bucket into your brother's bucket is charity. Then another thing that is recommended for a Muslim is to give gifts to his brother, give presents to his brother. Now, if it's a small thing, it doesn't have to be a uh, Rolex watch or something. And, uh, even if it's a small thing, it's good to have the habit of giving gifts uh, to your brothers every now and then. Uh, so uh, you know, that creates love in our hearts for each other. Um, in the hands of Salah and says, if you exchange gifts, you would love each other. So also Salah is recommending that we exchange gifts amongst ourselves. Right? Uh, and it is also recommended for uh, a Muslim to accept his brother's gift. So if your brother gives you gifts, you know, should probably be allowed to worry. You know, it's not the type of thing that I want. In fact, you know, so it's also recommended that you accept uh, your brother's gift. Uh, yeah, in a hadith of Aisha of Allah, uh, reported by Bukhari, uh, she said that the messenger, messenger of Allah, Allah used to accept gifts and give gifts in return. So he would accept gifts, so Allah and he also used to give gifts in return. Uh, Allah also said, 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 And uh, that increases the love uh, for each other. Uh, if someone gives you, gives you a gift, what should you do?
keeping your brother's secret. Okay? If, if he confides in you, if, if he say he comes to you with a problem, and he says, brother, look, I'm facing this problem, etc. Regarding his personal life, keep it secret. Don't go around broadcasting it like BBC. Yeah. So if he has trusted you, uh, if he has trusted you um, to share his you know, personal matters with you, then you should keep, keep that trust. Uh, and it is not necessary that you should say, brother, keep my, you know, keep this thing secret. It is not necessary for him to explicitly say it. You know, if he's from his body language, you can tell that if it's something that he would not like you to share with others, then abstain from sharing with others. Um, again, in a hadith, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, if a man speaks to another and looks around to see if anyone can hear them, then this is the trust. So, you know, a man speaks to you and then he looks around. Is there anyone around? So that, that is enough indication to mean that it is a trust on you, you cannot dispose it to someone else. Right? So it is obligatory to you to keep that trust and not leak it um, you know, elsewhere and make the issue known to, um, to other people. And then um, giving advice to the brothers. The Prophet said, uh, he said three times, the religion is Nasiha, sincere advice. We say to whom? The Sahaba was to To whom? The Prophet said to Allah, His Book, His Messenger, and to the leaders of the Muslims and the common people. So, you know, the, the Prophet is emphasizing on, on um, the sincere advice that you give to your brothers. It's just, it's a, you know, we should have that uh, concern for, for our brothers that you know, if, we don't talk, if we think we can. Benefit him through some advice, we should offer it to him. We should not hold, hold it back. And we should offer it to him in the, in the most polite manner. In the most polite manner. You know, we should not just go and tell him off uh, or make it sound like we're dictating him. Right? So we should offer our advice in a very, very polite manner. But then you know, offering advice is something, uh, good advice, offering good advice is something that uh, Allah has encouraged. I'd like to end soon. I'd like to conclude my talk soon. And uh, the last hadith that I want to discuss is the hadith that's mentioned in the event library. Uh, because we've read it. Uh, it's a very beautiful hadith. It talks about the rise of the Muslim. Um, so I'll, I'll you know, just uh, quickly read it out to you. And then there's some certain points that I'll uh, just uh, elaborate before I conclude, inshallah. Um, so this hadith. Reported by Muslim on the authority of Abu Dhabi of the Allah one. Um, Mr. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A Muslim owes six obligations towards another Muslim. When you meet him, salute him, saying Assalamu Alaikum. When he invites you, accept the invitation. When he or she solicits your advice, advise him or her sincerely. When he or she sneezes and praises Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, respond with the supplication, Ya Allah. When he falls sick, visit him on his death, join his funeral. So a number of things are mentioned here, right? The first thing that is mentioned is saying salam. Now giving salam is sunnah. It is uh, sunnah to give salam. So, um, you know, make this habit of spreading the salam. And say, saying the salam is sunnah and returning it is, you know, it is, um, it's what you plan. So, if, uh, as in if you're in a group, you know, say for example here, uh, there are a number of brothers, and a uh, brother walks in the masjid and he says salam, at least one of us should respond to the salam. Right? If, you know, uh, because it is uh, obligatory for us to respond to the salam. It was sunnah for him to say the salam. But once he said it, then it is obligatory to um, uh, for this gathering to respond. And his one should respond to that um, And returning the salam in a manner that is audible to the brother who says salam to you. So if he says the salam alayhi wa then you say to yourself, why the salam? That's not the way to do it. Rather, you know, you should uh, say, it up, say it out loud so you can hear it. Because if you can't hear it, then the obligation is not fulfilled. Even if you say it to yourself, you 
just mumbled. Um, the combination still remains on Google, so you should say it out loud. Um, and also, you should try and uh, say more than what you said. If you said, Assalamu alaikum, you should go back and Assalamu alaikum, it's good to uh, return the Salaam uh, in, in a better manner. And then, uh, if you invite you, you accept the invitation. Now, uh, two things. It's, uh, it's recommended that you uh, accept the invitation of others uh, if they, if they um, invite you. Um, a few points though. Um, the invitation, especially regarding Walima, you know, if uh, some of the married with Walima uh, it is very important, especially for the Walima, that you, that you accept the invitation of the Walima. Because, uh, um, you know, the Prophet Allah has really emphasized it. And it's far differ as to um, you know, whether it's obligatory or is it you know, uh, an emphasized sunnah. So the scholars differ as to whether you, know, you must accept unless you have a, you know, unless you have some serious excuse or um, or is it uh, uh, is it obligatory or is it, a, uh, is it an emphasized sunnah such that you should really accept it unless you have some really bad excuse. So the scholars differ on the on the ruling, uh, but uh, there's a hadith that I would like to mention here. If one of you is invited to a wedding, um, to a wedding, then he must accept the invitation. The well, Prophet Allah has been emphasizing that if you are invited to a wedding, make sure that you, uh, that you uh, attend it. Um, now, this, uh, another thing though, um, in the weddings that we see in our couple sometimes, not, they don't necessarily always you know, abide by the Sharia rules mixed gatherings and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things happening which are not uh, in line with uh, Islam and it, it, it conflicts uh, Sharia rules. Well, in those gatherings you should not be part of it. You know, there's music, dance, pre mixing and all of that happening. We, we should, uh, if we want uh, good for the brothers and sisters who are invited us, we should probably advise them politely if they are able to. But uh, those sort of gatherings, you know, they're, uh, Really, Sharia rules are being violated. We should, uh, we should not be uh, part of such gatherings. So, you know, we should not go there. So, look, I'm invited. So I must attend. But then, all the time after the happening over there, so, yeah, you, you, you should, uh, you should uh, avoid those sort of gatherings where clearly there's you know, mixed uh, gathering, there's no segregation, etc., and uh, a lot of uh, understandings are going to happen. Um, And then uh, the next few points, if you ask for advice, give him sincere advice. And I've already mentioned it. If he sneezes and pray to Allah, say, Ya Allah. If you fall sick, visit him. If you fall sick, visit him. And that's uh, important because sometimes you may have, I don't know, like international students who probably don't have the time visit Right? And you fall sick. You are his family. Right? You should go and visit him. I'm just giving you an example. I don't understand to an international student. I'll probably answer your question after I finish my position. So I'm just giving you an example. Right? So you should be like a family. So that if someone is sick, you should find um, um, visit him, see uh, how he's going, how he can help out, etc. Um, and if he dies, you should attend his funeral. And there's a great devotee attending the, the, the funeral. Although the, the Janata player is. Uh, it's hard to find how everyone has to do it, but it's very important for those who attend the Janaza and then for those who accompany uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the deceased to the, to the graveyard. So we should find you know, uh, practice of all these things, inshallah. As I said before, um, I won't you know, drag my talk too long. Um, the end is getting cold, and uh, I don't want to hold you back. So I'd, uh, I'd like to make it, inshallah. Um, we can, uh, if you have questions, Ask me now or um, why do you have to be there? Yeah. So, um, let's have to end here. So, I'm going to say that I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. Any questions? Any others? Any others? Yes. Can I know if someone's face is going to say, Alhamdulillah, 